So welcome to the Closing the Data Gap panels. Uh, we have a very interesting panel today. My name is Gypsy Escobar. I'm the Director of Innovation Research at Measures for Justice, uh, which is an organization that is creating a national system of performance measurement for local criminal justice. Um, we've been collecting data on the criminal justice system since 2011, so we know a little bit about the data gap, and we're very excited today about uh, the innovations that our panelists are, uh, you know, taking care of to to help with the data gap. So, um, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to um, I'm going to introduce a bit a bit of the problem. Then we're going to uh, have our panelists talk a little about a bit about the innovations um, that each of their organizations um, is doing to close the data gap. Um, then we'll have a conversation, and during that conversation, we'll also open it to you guys um, to ask any questions. So if there is any burning question that is coming up to you as they are presenting, uh, please jot it down. There will be time for a Q&A at the end of the session and to engage in a conversation with you guys as well. Um, so our panelists today are Juan Cartagena, who is the President and General Counsel, Counsel at Latino Justice. Clementine Jacoby, who is the Executive Director of Recidivist. Mike, Michael Pouchet, I call him Mike, but he's Michael Pouchet, Chief of Staff of the uh, Florida House Judiciary Committee. And Mimi Stiles, Founder and President at Measure. And you'll learn uh, a bit more about the organizations in a second. So I just wanted to uh, um, put um, on the table what the problem is. Why are we talking about closing the data gap? And what is the data gap? Um, so. When, since, since 2011, when we started doing this work, uh, back then, back then, eight years ago, um, people were saying there is no data in criminal justice, right? Nobody is collecting criminal justice data. It's a problem, right? But in, in, since then, since we've been doing this work, what we found is that there is no third of criminal justice data. Agencies, criminal justice agencies, are collecting data routinely on a daily basis, right, in their case management systems um, and uh, using it for basically just case tracking. So the problem is not a lack of data. The problem is that um, there's several other problems, right? And sure, there are many small um, agencies around the country that do uh, collect data, but not in a computerized way, so it's not really actionable or usable data, right? Like their files still contain, like paper files still contain data, but it's not, um, you know, it's not usable in bulk to look at patterns. But a large number of agencies do uh, have the data in a usable way. But what are the problems that we found? It's not lack of data. The problems are elsewhere. So first of all, it's an extreme decentralization problem, right? Each agency within each jurisdiction has their own case uh, uh, management system or data collection process, right? And those often are not interoperable, which basically means that the agencies within the same jurisdiction are not talking to each other in terms of data. They do not use things that you'll think are basic, like a uniform case number, right? That will help them match the data from the prosecutor to the data from the court to the data from the jail, et cetera, et cetera. Those things don't, don't, don't exist. They're kept in silos even within each jurisdiction. They don't talk to each other. Um, and uh, so that's problem one. Extreme decentralization and silos where uh, not talking to each other. The other big problem is the lack of uniformity. Right? Um, there are each of these agencies, even within each jurisdiction, they have their own definitions about what case means, they have their own definitions about what diversion means, they have their own de definitions about w even arraignment, what arraignment means. Terminology is different across agencies and jurisdictions. Um, they all capture data in different ways, um, they're not standardized. And this is, introduces a lot of error, and it makes it difficult to uh, use the data to look at patterns across jurisdictions that state level policymakers can, um, can uh, uh, need to identify. And the last issue that I wanted to bring back uh, is the lack of transparency and issues of public policy. 
So the core data is considered in many states as public access data. Um, the court sometimes may interpret the law uh, in, as not allowing them to share the data in bulk uh, with researchers or policymakers, reporters, anybody who asks for them, um, including advocates. And the same is true of jail, uh, jail data, right? It's considered public access. Um, but oftentimes with the jail data, what you are um, kind of like, uh, stuck with is looking at their uh, inmate case lookup systems, which tend to be contemporaneous and tend not to have his they tend not to capture or make public historical data. So that that's also a problem there. However, access to data say from prosecutors is in a much more gray area. Um, is not necessarily public access. Um, you know, so some people think you know this is taxpayer money and therefore should be made public, uh, but. Prosecutors say there is a lot of material information there for cases that we cannot make public, therefore we don't make our data publicly accessible, though, um, though it's, there are some offices across the country that are changing their data practices. So basically the picture that I wanted to paint today uh, before we hear about the innovations here um, is a picture where there are data, data are out there. The problem is we, they are, imagine, about, so imagine, so we have about 3,000 counties, about five agencies per county, so that's like 15,000 silos, right? Uh, and I'm not counting police, right, because that's a whole other animal. Um, imagine a world where none of those data sets talk to each other, even within the same jurisdiction. Imagine a world where um, everybody within that jurisdiction and across the state and across the states are doing the data collection differently right, defining things differently and using different terminology, and when there are issues of transparency and, and public access. Um, so it's a very complex ecosystem, um, and uh, let's hear how our panelists are, uh, are dealing with it. So I'm gonna start with Juan Cartagena. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Latino Justice is doing? Sure, I'll take one of these, no? Hello. So hi, so my name is Juan Cartagena. I am the President General Counsel of Latino Justice Pearl Def, a civil rights organization that uses uh, the law to effectuate cho social change on behalf of Latinx communities in the country. So um, I'm one of the advocates on this panel, so you're gonna hear, I'm really sandwiched by amazing tech folk, which I'm gonna learn from in a minute. But our, our biggest goal at Latino Justice on the issue of the data gap is to refer to the race ethnicity data gap uh, and the problems that portends for the country. In fact, my biggest goal is to make the invisible visible to all. And that is the plight that the criminal justice system also has on Latinx communities throughout the United States. Difficult to do so without the data, a lot, very difficult to do so in a white black binary in so many different states across the board, and part and parcel difficult because of our you know, consistently ineffectual way to talk about race and how it's manifesting in the United States above and beyond what happens to the black community. So because of those kind of filters and those kind of like historical uh, consequences, the job to try to make sure that we finally get the data is mired in other aspects mm -hmm. um, that affect an organization like mine very, very directly. Um, so how do we do this? We, we use quite a number of tools. At Latino Justice, I have, I have an incredible staff of, of mostly attorneys, but also some organizers and some advocates. Um, we have headquarters here in New York City, but with an office in Orlando, a satellite office in uh, Long Island, and I just, we just got a, a wonderful staff member to join us out of Austin, Texas, to do all kind of policy work in the South as well, Southwest and Southeast. We use research. Um, we, uh, we've been uh, part and parcel of a conversation that led to uh, being on a small committee with uh, the Urban Institute that issued an interactive report called The Alarming Lack of Data on Latin Latinxes in the Criminal Justice System. It's on their website. It's an interactive report on uh, urbaninstitute.org. Uh, we do polling data for Latinx populations on various issues regarding their experiences and their opinions, and of course we poll 
on this issue. And if, as you can imagine, Latino populations are very, very insistent that they should be recognized and counted separately and recognized as, uh, as the body that they are. We, might, we have to remind ourselves we're talking about a population that is likely to be close to a third in 2060 of the United States. Like 30% is the estimate between now and 2060. So we're talking about a, a sizable population that is still yet to figure out how it's being affected by these systems. Um, we use advocacy, the advocacy in the public sphere. Uh, when I go to conferences to talk about the Latino data gap and legislative advocacy as well in various places in various states. Um, we support data collection sometimes at the county level. We're gonna hear quite a bit about Florida and I'm really gonna learn a lot about more about Florida right now with you. But even in Florida, when we couldn't get the data at the state level, we were supportive of people who were forcing local county commissioners to force data collection at a local level with their county systems as well, um, because of the gap was so large in Florida. Um, and of course, we do model, uh, we do legislative advocacy. So right now, we're working on some potential models for model legislation to across the country to try to address some of these issues of the Latino data gap, and we're trying to track improvements. Um, the one in Florida portends to be really, really important. Um, how it's manifested for racial and ethnicity data is the key. So in a nutshell, we use all those tools to address some severe problems, right? Uh, effectively, what we're talking about in the country um, is uh, differentiation between how Latino populations are counted at each point in the system and all the faults and, and shortcomings that Gypsy noted you know, apply two or three times to this population as well as you can easily imagine. We are, there are certain states that have just, and I've only focused on prison population alone, um, some data out of the sentencing project demonstrates that a handful of states have a higher proportion in their prisons who are Latinx, more than the population as a whole in the country. So the country is about 17%, 18% Latino as of now, but growing by leaps and bounds as I mentioned before. And there's some states like New Mexico could high, as high as 60% of the population in prisons, and that state could be uh, Hispanic. Um, California, Arizona, about 42%. And about seven some odd states have a proportion of one in five, over 20% within their prison systems alone, uh, based on the data we have, and we don't know how accurate that data is. We got some significant problems in how the data is collected. Is it collected by self-identification? Is it collected by the system? Um, I love this quote out of a, a news piece out of New Mexico. New Mexico just boggles my mind. It is literally 45, 43% lot Hispanic, uh, and they don't release any racial or ethnic, ethnic data across any one of their spectrums. And it still boggles my mind. Um, but uh, the quote that I read uh, earlier to get prepared for this panel was, um, a booking agent, a person who works the system in New Mexico because the system allows uh, as the system it actually uses to classify people based on what they see. And the quote was, well, when I'm not sure, I usually check the white box. So that's the biggest problem, right? That's the, first, that's the next biggest problem I want to alert you to, that when you don't have data based on Latino disaggregated from whites, blacks, Asians, others, then you have an overrepresentation of whites in the system and an underrepresentation of Latinos, and of course, an underrepresentation of the real gap between white and black, which is a problem across the board. So, what we're doing now is trying to focus on the states that have these gaps at the highest levels um, and trying to understand how we get there. I'll end with this. The Urban Institute report that I referred to you before only assesses publicly available data. Data is available both publicly and uh, maintain relatively frequently. By publicly, they said they only looked at state's databases that were available online, and if you had a very good system of issuing race, race and ethnicity data that includes Latino populations, then you got a high mark because you issued it that way. If you disaggregated from race, you have a higher mark that way, and if you have it on the five systems that they were looking at, arrest, prison, imprisonment, imprisonment by type of offense, parole and probation, then you would get another check mark as well. And we learned from the Urban Institute report a couple of clear things. Number one, Alaska is the best state in the country. If you want to know how many Latino, Latinos are in, this, in any prison system or arrestee system, parole system, probation system, that's the gold standard, Alaska. Um, and 
believe it or not, these are the following four states that rank after Alaska. Idaho, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Texas. So Alaska is about 70% Latino total population. Idaho is about 12%, Oklahoma 11%, Oregon is 13%, Texas is major, as you know, 39% Latino. So they have a high concentration of Latinos in the population. They have a very good way of data, collecting data. That's not always the case, as we all know, with Florida and other states. The Urban Institute was actually focusing again to repeat data that's readily accessible to the public, data that's maintained frequently, and or relatively soon, relatively close. Some states had the data, but they don't release it. So it was a problem for us, we're trying to research it. But that being said, the questions for us as advocates in the Latino world is how do we get up, how do we pinpoint what needs to be happening so we can get as accurate picture of how the system also affects Latinx populations. Thank you. That's great, thank you, Juan. Um, Clementine? Hi, I'm Clementine. I'm the director of Recidiviz, which is actually a, a nonprofit tech company, so a little bit of a different angle. Um, and we're a relative newcomer to this space. Aha, there's our slide. Um, I have been working in some small way on criminal justice reform since I was five, when my uncle went into prison, but more recently um, came to the space from Google, where I was working previously. And so most of our team is coming from that tech lens. Um, and I think Gypsy did a really beautiful job of laying out uh, the criminal justice data barriers. There are a lot of problems in the space with the way that data is initially collected, which I think Juan was just talking about. Sometimes the data is not collected at all um, with the way the data is stored in, in databases that are, that are lossy, um, meaning that they get overwritten uh, when something new happens, which destroys your ability to look at data from before. Um, in the way that they're siloed and not talking to each other, uh, in the way that data is standardized and defined, and then um, in some ways, most importantly, the way that data is actually made actionable to the people who are in a position to make decisions based on that data. And so I thought that I would talk a little bit more about that last piece because it's one that um, our shop spends a lot of time thinking about. But first, just to give you a little bit of an overview of recidivism, I think there are kind of three key things to the way that we're trying to do things. Um, our overall goal is to build the capacity to do this analysis within criminal justice agencies and across criminal justice agencies. And so the first tenet of, of the way we're trying to approach this is to make everything open source. And the idea here is that the criminal justice data barriers in this space are so enormous that no one organization is ever gonna be able to solve them. But uh, by themselves. But what we can do is sort of, sorry, we will be able to solve them, just, just not a single organization by themselves. And so um, what we should be doing is trying to contribute to reusable functionality that um, researchers, advocates, and practitioners alike can be leveraging. So that's sort of the first principles. Everything that we're building uh, on our engineering team is open source, and we're trying to work with others to also build open source technology. The second piece is uh, it's very important to be responsible with this data, which seems like an understatement, but I think it's pretty common to have tech actors who aren't domain experts, and we count ourselves among those, and so we try very hard to partner with people who are domain experts on specific vertical decisions with, within this space, so that when we're bringing in massive amounts of data, we're actually mapping it in sensible ways to some kind of standard schema. Um, we also have our own set of responsible practices from data privacy and security that I think are equally important and we try to marry those two things. And then the last piece is that we try really hard to make this data actionable because as you probably know, most folks in the space are not trained as analysts and they're not used to looking at data and so often the way that data can have the biggest impact is by not looking like data at all. <laughs> Um, and by looking like a very sort of targeted insight where you've got the right data to the right person at the right time that's going to actually create a behavior change. Um, so I have a few slides on that. Is there a way for me to change the slides or? I feel like that'll be easier in the long run for both of us. Thanks, Leah. Okay. Um, I'll stand over here actually. So, so this is our mission to reduce incarceration through behavior change. And so what that means is actually for us, even though we're a tech organization and even though almost all of us are engineers that spend our time like bringing data into a standard format from across silos, really data is like sort of a means to an end because the actual end is getting uh, agencies to change their behavior using this data. Oh, I got the panelists moving. Okay, sorry. So, so I think the point here is that like, <laughs> 
data is not actually inherently useful, which is maybe a surprising thing to hear from like a data person, but fundamentally, like imagine that you've solved all of the problems Gypsy just whoa all of the problems that Gypsy described, right? Like you still have a problem because people don't know how to use this data. Um, and so I just wanted to show you like really quickly three principles that we use on our team to try to turn data into action. Uh, like data is definitely boring until proven otherwise. And this is like really sad for people like me who love data and spend all their time on it, but it just is true. Like the burden of making data relevant is on you as a data person. And so what that means is like thinking really, really hard, not only about how you make sure that the data is true and standard and de-siloed, but also about like how you're showing it to people and, and uh, respecting the fact that they have a very limited amount of time. And so in practice, like what this means for our products, and, and here's an example of one of the things that we build on the right, in practice what this means is like assume they don't care about your data. Um, and, and when I say they, most of what recidivist builds right now is for practitioners in the criminal justice system. So we actually get access to the data by telling jurisdictions, like, we're going to show you this data in formats that are useful to you and help you make decisions differently. Um, so that's been a really powerful approach to getting access to all of the different data silos in the first place so that we can de-silo them. Um, but in order to build tools that are useful for them, we have to build as though people aren't going to see on the right, you can see an example of an email that we send that shows the supervisor of all of the parole officers in District 10 that his unit is an outlier this month. And so this is like timely information, and it's telling him that right now there's something you can do about the fact that your unit across the state is performing the worst. And by the way, like it turns out that from a behavioral science perspective, where most of these principles are stolen from, it's a really big deal to compare people to their neighbors. Uh, so that's one way to drive change and by the way, all of this is really cribbed from behavioral science, so hopefully it's useful to you in some form. Like, this is very nonspecific to what we're doing. So the, the second way to do this is to make it actionable. Um, so one really disempowering way to uh, present data, which I'm sure you all know, is to have the data be stale. Um, and, and that's one of the kind of hidden data barriers in this space, is that even when we get data, we get it to people like long past the time when they could actually intervene. having the impact that it could be having. So this is an example of a map that we show a state. If you recognize the shape of states, then you know which state. But any state uh, that shows you these red dots are saying like there's a high rate of technical revocations in these districts. And so you can actually click on the district and try to understand more about what's going on like right now. Uh, so the second principle is that you should, uh, not necessarily you, but we in general, really try to design for behaviors that already exist. So product design, there's this thing called the toothbrush test, which means that you should have a very clear understanding of why the thing you're building is going to be used at least two times a day, if it's going to be like a sort of radical success in changing behavior. And so what this looks like in practice is that all over the criminal justice system, there are really impactful decisions being made. These are examples from program evaluation. We very often use the data that we have to help agencies understand how their rehabilitation and reentry programs are performing, meaning reducing recidivism or not. And, and these are ways where we can sort of plug the data into action. So for example, there's already existing case planning processes where you're sort of matching people to programs. And so what if those things were based on not how many hours are in the program, but actually like which programs are likely to help that person succeed based on their needs. Um, and you can imagine a, a lot of you know, different use cases for this. These are all from the, the program evaluation side of the house. Another is just like which programs get audited. Like very often states have the ability Imagine these for your own use cases, but the point is, like, it's a lot easier to not invent a new process for reviewing data. Um, there's more work on you, but it's much more likely to be impactful if you can bring the data, this is what we think, into existing decision making. And then the third and last thing is to know what success looks like and measure it. So in my experience in this space, which is limited, but, but I think somewhat representative, like, it's very, very find a leader who has no idea what they're trying to do from a success perspective. But it's very common to find one that can't measure success. Um, and so helping them do that can be really, really powerful for helping things move in the right direction. So this is another example of a thing that we build. Um, and, and data kind of plays a role in, in all of the pieces around sort of defining what is this goal. So this chart right here is, is showing the leadership what they're aiming for 
on technical revocations across the state. This is for the director of corrections in this case. And so this dashed red line is a goal that was set based on their historical data. This is what it would mean to get them to historic lows for technical revocations, the lowest it's ever been. So they know where they're going and, that, and data helps do that, but it's also helping them track their progress along the way, identify bottlenecks. And then the, the last thing that I think has been surprising to me is that data in this space has always been used as a stick. Or so many of the, so many of the use cases I've seen for data are kind of like um, pointing out bad apples, but it, it's pretty clear from behavioral science that data is often more effective when used to celebrate successes. And so one of the things we've been trying to work a lot with jurisdictions on when we get access to their data is how we can kind of weave celebration of success and have the data drive that uh, into culture as well to hold up the good examples. So that's the summary. Um, and I just want to show you one more thing, um, an example from North Dakota, which was the very first state that we started working in and so how things look there now. So when we started in North Dakota, the was go in and uh, exactly like Gypsy said, there were sort of um, 22 different data silos that we had to wire up and standardize. Um, that was the first step, but once we got there, we realized like, yes, in fact, data is boring. Uh, we need to do much more to kind of weave the data into their actual practices uh, to help them make changes. And, and then, um, you know, this is a press release that you can't see the top of from the governor of North Dakota announcing these four concrete success metrics that they're now using to uh, use the data to set these goals and then track their progress towards them um, over the next two years. So in summary, that's what we're working on. Um, and if you have thoughts on how you're using data to help people make better decisions, I'd be super curious to hear about them. So this is our uh, contact info. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today. I'll wait for our slides to come up. My name is Mimi Stiles. I get to be the president and the founder of this amazing organization called Measure. Um, we began with being called Measure Austin, a project, and I'll let you know a little bit more about that. Um, our mission at Measure is to use data to educate and empower people, um, communities that are most disparately impacted by the statistics that we're talking about, um, to use that information to then self advocate. So I'm super like interested in the conversations that we had earlier today because people were talking about data, but then they were saying, okay, well, how do we get communities to use this data in order to move the needle, in order to measure success? Like, how do we define what these key performance indicators are? Well, guess what? If you give this information to the community, that's when you're really empowering them. Next slide. And so the goals that measure are pretty simple. We, number one, uh, um, use data to address systemic injustice. Um, we, number two, connect people to the institutions that serve them for collaborative solutions. And number three, we provide disruptive, informative, and innovative training. And so next slide. Now that I got the, the more kind of boring part of what I do, um, in reality, I'm a storyteller. <laughs> so. I am a mom of black sons. I am the sister of three brothers who all experience a mental wellness issue and who are all or have been justice um, involved. I am the cousin of um, a, um, a man who just got out of Folsom a couple of days ago. And so I use my experience in order to inform the way that our organization has been created um, because I believe in the power um, of, the, of when a community that is impacted by data, when they use their voice, then change can happen. And so this picture here, let me just kind of give you a little bit of context. Uh, measure started back in 2015. On February 8th, 2016, David Joseph, I'm gonna always say his name, was shot and killed in Austin, Texas. He was 17 years old. He was a black young man, black young boy, sorry, um, who was running through the streets completely naked. And so when we talk about uh, unarmed black men being shot, when I think about David Joseph, I think of like he should have been the, 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 the young man that everyone kind of looked at because when you talk about being unarmed, he had no clothes on. And so I led a, a pretty big um, 
advocacy campaign to have the officer that shot and killed David um, fired from the Austin Police Department. That did happen. However, through that process, through that traumatic and um, traumatizing process, quite honestly, for the community, I realized that we needed something more. I was placed on a panel to quote unquote represent the community. I don't know how many advocates are in here that have been placed on a panel to represent the community. Yeah, uh-huh, because, you know, so I'm the black woman, and the expectations of me was to be the angry black woman activist on the panel, right? Yeah, um, and so when I sat down on that panel, I looked to my left and I looked to my right, and I realized this, you know, this, this, um, this feeling of being that token, right? Um, and so what I, and yeah, I said that word, token. And so what I said to myself was, self, instead of being angry, instead of leading with gut emotion, let me lead with questions that, that will signify the, you know, how are we assessing community policing in, our, in, our, um, in Austin? How are we measuring trust? Who's getting this survey? What's the survey methodology? What are the key performance indicators that assess this notion of trust building within the city of Austin. And so I began to get some synergy around this idea. At the same time, I alienated a lot of the people that were you know, with me in the beginning because I wasn't representing that, that voice, right? But instead, I knew in my, in my mind if we could, if we could tap, tap into the data and bring the community around the data, then we might, we might be heard. And so we have been. Next slide. And so my theory of change here is if people are empowered to use data, it'll provide a common language upon which community members can meet, understand the causes and impacts of overcriminalization, you know, the school to cradle, the, the cradle to prison pipeline, so forth, public health of various institutional practices and work together to create equitable change and increased awareness. Let me just talk real quick about equitable change and about equity real fast, if you don't mind. When I think about equity, I think about the likelihood of safety. How likely is it that a person that is born in one zip code is going to be able, is, is going to live as long as another person born in another zip code? How likely is it that my black son, who is huge and plays for San Diego State, how likely is it that he's going to be able to leave out of my door and come back home alive? How likely is it that me as a mom or a, a person that may end up having a, a child one day, how likely is it that I am going to come back alive, right? So when I think about equity, I think about the likelihood of safety. Next slide. So some of the, some of the work that has resulted from um, this, this, you know, bringing communities together, using data, leading with the data, allowing communities to be that voice of change um, in their neighborhoods has resulted in this fantastic big data and community policing conference where I quite literally give the power to those academic activists to provide training to law enforcement. It's quite simple. A lot of us activists are very, uh, you know, are, have been through, through, through college, we're brilliant, we are experts in our own experience, and they can come up with some pretty innovative curriculums, and we bring all of those curriculums together and provide a platform where we can meet and create, create change. We are, we've just partnered with the University of San Diego. The next conference that you'll see like this is in January 10th through the 11th, um, 2020 and everyone is invited. We literally bring together activists, police officers, researchers, and techies in order to address these systemic neighborhood issues. Um, and with, with the use of technology, we're also learning that, you know, there, police, police officers, police departments are finding that, okay, we don't have enough time in order to do community policing. Measure sits back and says, well, what is the technology that you're using right now in the police department? There's technology out there that have reduced um, reporting time by 80%. If you get away from the old systems that, that, have play, that literally plague a lot of our police departments. Next slide. All right, so the how. This, I say, is, is, could be part of the answer. This is one of our solutions. The solution for us is called the CARE model. 
C-A-R-E. It's the way that we mobilize communities. And thankfully to one foundation um, locally in Austin, Texas, we were able to formalize this model. We were able to bring together over 400 people and over 20 communities, um, community leaders of color in order to better understand how do we use data in order to empower people to create equitable change. Um, there should be a quick little video. The CARE model is a method for working in active partnership with communities to develop solutions to complex social problems. It provides a means for increasing meaningful engagement and minimizing all potential trauma to the community. The CARE model empowers organizations that serve people of color by providing direction to help communities lead the work. By utilizing the strategies and mechanisms outlined in the CARE model, organizations will have programs that result in changes that are equitable and representative of community members' voices, a means for accountability and transparency while empowering communities to be active in generating solutions. C, community is involved from the beginning. A, advocate with community to address disparities. R, generate solutions that strengthen community resilience. E, use data and evidence for data-informed decisions. The CARE model is deployed when an organization is deciding to work with an underserved population to address known disparities. Each letter in the CARE model represents a component of the community mobilization process that an organization will incorporate as they partner with communities to address problems. get tired of that video. And so yeah, so the CARE model is our solution to creating change with communities. Next slide. Some of the results of the CARE model are the following. Um, the first one was unanimous acceptance of metrics to assess use of force in Austin, Texas to inform the city budget. Very interesting, I'd love to share more about that on the panel. Um, the removal of the curfew ordinance in Austin, Texas. We are one organization that advocates for evidence-based policing. We partner directly with the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing, the Australian Society of Evidence-Based Policing, um, in order to create this new narrative. Um, we also have had five trainings for the big data program, um, and we have two care teams right now of community members that are all mobilized around the idea of health care access and then uh, also um, the, adult the adultification of black girls. So love to share more later, but thank you guys very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Poche. Uh, I'm an attorney and currently the staff director for the Judiciary Committee in the Florida House of Representatives. Uh, back in the summer of 2017, uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee at the time, uh, Representative Chris Sprouls from uh, the Clearwater St. Pete area, uh, wanted to know more about our criminal justice data statewide. Uh, what did we have? How were we collecting it? What was it being used for? Who was collecting it? Where was it stored? My staff and I began a lengthy inventory process uh, to find out the, the answers to those questions. And what we found was very similar to some of the things that uh, Gypsy pointed out uh, at the beginning of this panel meeting. Uh, we found that dozens of agencies, both at the state level and at the local level, were collecting hundreds of different data elements, some of which overlapped, uh, and they were collecting it for dozens of different reasons, uh, to be used internally for reports, to be used for statutory reports that they were uh, required to produce to either the state or the county uh, or for some other purpose. Um, so we began, uh, oh, I think more importantly, what we figured out too was that there were very important data elements that were not being collected by anybody. Uh, so then we embarked on a relationship with Measures for, for Justice to make heads or tails of what we had and how we would go about improving the data collection process uh, and how we could help uh, these reporters who were embarking on this data collection and not really doing anything with it uh, to make it a useful collection process. Uh, 
So in 2018, the 2018 session, uh, the legislature passed uh, and the governor signed a comprehensive criminal justice data transparency initiative bill, uh, first in its kind uh, that I am aware of uh, nationwide. Uh, and that bill did a few things. First of all, it defined uh, data elements that needed to be collected and directed certain uh, reporters to collect that data and report it to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, FDLE uh, is the data repository for a lot of other purposes, both statewide and for national purposes. So it, it, it stood to reason that FDLE would be the perfect place for this data to go. Uh, and the reporters included entities such as the clerks of court, uh, state attorneys, public defenders, Department of Corrections, uh, and uh, local county jail operators, some of which are private, some of which are uh, operated by the sheriffs, and one of which, I believe Orange County, is actually operated by Florida County Commissioners. Uh, those, entities, those entities were required to uh, send that data to FDLE uh, on a biweekly basis. Uh, in addition to that, the law also um, established a pilot project in the 6th Judicial Circuit, which is comprised of Pasco and Pinellas Counties, that's on the West Coast, Coast. That includes uh, towns like um, Clearwater, St. Petersburg, um, and is also uh, the area where the chairman is from. Uh, the chairman was a, uh, was a prosecutor in the 6th Judicial Circuit. Um, we partnered with a national not-for-profit who has very experience in doing this, Measures for Justice. Uh, and the purpose of that pilot project was to embed a data fellow who would help the reporters who were, who were required by this new law to report certain data uh, to comply with the law. Also, to extract data uh, from past records. Um, I believe Measures for Justice had been working in Florida for some time, uh, extracting those, those data elements and compiling reports. Uh, so part of the project was to, uh, to go back and extract more data as we got more technologically savvy. Uh, and also, um, in, along with the same process of reporting that data, uh, how could the Sixth Circuit do that in the most efficient way possible using the least amount of taxpayer funds as necessary? Um, the overarching goal was to create a publicly available database uh, with standard, accurate, and reliable data that was being reported apples to apples, oranges to oranges, by all of the reporters statewide. Uh, no small feat. Um, some folks use the analogy of turning around an aircraft carrier. Uh, I like to use the analogy of uh, data collection in Florida was at its infancy stage. Um, we had to resist uh, a lot of excitement from folks who wanted to jump right to collecting all kinds of data, including juvenile justice data, which carries a lot of privacy concerns to begin with, uh, but just jump right to a fully functional uh, data collection process when we were still because in the, we were in the infancy stage, we were still trying to hold our heads up and, and roll over, and then uh, before we could even take a step, people wanted to start running right from jump one. Um, and we wanted to make sure, uh, the legislature wanted to make sure that we built a solid foundation uh, for a, a database that could be extremely useful, functional, flexible, uh, and adaptable as uh, we were able to capture more data elements and incorporate more data reporters. The, um, another important part of that law, uh, and it relates to the, um, the pilot project, uh, we wanted the reporters, uh, with the help of Measures for Justice in the Sixth Circuit, to make all of those mistakes, uh, identify all of the roadblocks, identify all of the barriers, fix them and create a template that could be scaled up or down to larger and smaller circuits in Florida. Um, Florida's a very unique state uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of which is uh, there are circuits that are very rural and there are circuits that are very urban. Uh, and they all have uh, different levels of capability, uh, technological um, capacity. Uh, and the template uh, for how to do this, how to report the data under the new law, uh, was going to be very important to do it in the most efficient and quickest way possible. Uh, 
one of the things, uh, speaking of um, roadblocks and speed bumps, was the the law effective in July 2018 had some very tight deadlines. Um, the FDLE was going to make available data that it already had in its possession by January 1 of 2019. Uh, those reporters who were technologically advanced enough to comply with the technical specifications uh, would start reporting in March 1st of 2019 with the goal of everybody reporting everything to FDLE by July 1st, 2019. Well, we found out quickly during the 2019 session, which was uh, January through March of this year, um, that there were things that still needed to be worked through and there were some challenges. Um, the establishment of those deadlines were to spur action, and it did. Um, beginning in July 1st of 2018, all of the reporters, Measures for Justice, everybody started working together to define data elements, come up with data dictionaries, which I think was the most important first step in uh, ensuring we had that accurate, reliable, valid data. Um, and the other thing that started happening was um, what I referred to earlier today when we were talking up here is data fiefdoms started to break down. You started to break down those walls that a lot of these agencies had. Uh, this is our data. We use it for this purpose. Um, we like doing it the way we're doing it. Why do we have to do it the way the state dictates how we're doing it? And the reason was because everybody was doing it differently. The data wasn't reliable. The, da the data wasn't accurate. Um, and in order to ensure that it was useful down the road, we had to standardize all of that data, and that started with everybody agreeing to sit down in a room or on a conference call and figure out what the best data elements were going to be, how we were going to define those data elements, uh, uh, a drop-down box to ensure that there were five selections for each data element or whatever the case may be, and that uh, a reporter in Escambia County in Pensacola in the Panhandle was reporting the same thing that a Miami reporter in Miami-Dade County was reporting, and that ensured that reliability. Um, Thinking back to um, uh, resisting the calls from uh, stakeholders to um, expand this data project right off the bat, um, that is certainly the ideal. Uh, we are building the process so that uh, it is flexible, it can be increased, and it will be available to everyone. But it is incredibly important at this point to build that foundation, and that's where we are. Uh, this past session in 2019, um, we learned a lot of things, so we added data elements to be, to be reported. We added reporters, we added the Justice Administration Commission, and we also added the Criminal Conflict Regional Council offices to get more data, to make it more comprehensive. We have the ability to do that. So this is a multi-year, uh, multi-phase project uh, that we're embarking on, but it's an incredibly important to do it right at the beginning so that down the road, it's useful, it can tell, tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and potentially dedicate resources to the things that are actually working uh, and trying something different than the things that are not working. Great, thank you so much, Mike. And that's that's a great segue to start the conversation here. Um, so one of the things that I wanna ask of you all is the, this issue of the cultural shift, right? Like a lot of these changes need um, you know, organizational cultures to change, system-wide cultures to change. Um, one, one anecdote that we love to tell uh, Measures for Justice is back when we started in 2011, um, you know, people were telling us, you know, but you cannot compare counties to each other. One is an apple and one is an orange. And our executive director will say, well, but what's, what can you compare an apple and an orange? One is red and smooth and the other one is bumpy and orange, right? What cannot they be compared? And we've seen a cultural change nationally, uh, you know, away from like you cannot compare counties to each other, right? To um, to being more accepting of data and more accepting of um, you know those kinds of comparisons in terms of performance measurement. So um, I would like to hear from from all of you um, what have been those cultural cultural shifts that have permitted your projects to move forward, and what are the cultural shifts that still need to happen for, for full success. So I'll start with Mimi. Yeah, cultural shifts. Um, that's a really great word because what where, where measure um, exists is 
quite often between the community, again, that's most disparately impacted, and then institutions like the police department, right? And so what we've learned in terms of like cultural shifts is that we need police officers that are willing to be disruptive. Um, and so that to me has been pretty amazing to see in Austin because we do have police officers that are willing to be disruptive. As a matter of fact, we have a few police, um, senior level police officers that work directly with our advocacy organization. Um, and when when they push against their, the, oh, their narrative, like in the department, then other police officers start to sing the same, same song and start to work with the community. And so that's, to me, has been the biggest um, cultural shift. Also in the activist community, you know, I'm not, when I first started here, I did not like the police. Matter of fact, I had choice words for the police. Um, and, but luckily got to work directly with Chief um, Art Acevedo out of Houston, Texas, who is extremely progressive um, in ways. Um, <laughs> I can't give them all, not yet. But, and then also with Chief Manley, who is out of Austin. Um, and so even the activist community has seen this cultural shift of like, okay, collaborative solutions, collaborative thinking might prove beneficial for our city. Um, and so that, to me, would be the biggest cultural shifts, being able to push against the fabric of your own thought. Should I just use this one? Yeah. OK. Um, so for us, I think it's that advocates have done a really good job of creating pressure on states to decarcerate. Um, Recidiv is, is primarily trying to use technology and address some of these data barriers in order to help agencies themselves see which of the things that they're trying are working and how things like staff behavior and funding are, for example, contributing to reducing recidivism or reducing racial disparity. And when we started this, we got a lot of feedback. Like before we had done anything, we got a lot of feedback that agencies would never let us see the data. Like we would never get a data sharing agreement signed. Even if we did, there would be individuals within agencies who wouldn't let us access it. The IT departments would brick us, et cetera. And that, it seems, is an, is an antiquated view, at least with the agencies we've worked with. So we're working in five states now, and we tend to sort of go in at the top level, either starting with the governor or with the director of corrections. Um, and they have let us have access to the data, and I think it's because the advocates have done a really good job of creating um, pressure on agencies to be more effective. And so for some states, that's they're literally being sued because their prisons are overcrowded um, and there are high rates of violence. But for other states, it's because they, they want to know what their racial disparities look like, and they have no way to measure that on an ongoing basis. For others, it's that the rate of technical revocations is really, really high. Um, and nobody really wants people going back to prison for not committing a new crime. And so what we tend to do is kind of ride that cultural wave. Like we go in and say, you know, you have the highest rate of technical revocations in the country. Let us help you get that under control. Let us help you commit to a quantifiable goal around that. And in order to do that, in order to help you make progress on it, we're going to sort of measure everything. Um, and ladder those much smaller and more actionable and more granular metrics up to this this big goal that the governor cares about. So that was, I, I think, without that shift, we wouldn't really be able to do what we were doing. Like, we have not had trouble uh, getting access to agencies' data in the same way that, for example, Measures for Justice had to deal with, you know, eight years ago when they started doing this work. So I think that's pretty huge. Sure. Three quick examples. Um, and I agree with you 100% that organizers and activists are the ones that are putting the pressure on these institutions to actually yeah. uh, talk about effectiveness. The best data uh, push that resulted in that kind of change in the culture was here in New York City with the data that was produced on um, previous litigation against the New York City Police Department regarding stop and frisk uh, practices. That data resulted in, in 4.1 million records for us to study. And my office was part of a team, various teams of attorneys that uh, led to the lawsuits that started to curb, stop, and fisk. But the data shift, or the shift in culture, I should say, was just the pressure by the community to stop the detainment of so many black and Latino people in the, United, in the in New York cities. And that was a shift 
in policing attitudes and a shift in what would have meant to be uh, to strive towards public safety without the harassing nature of excessive policing. The other example that I can give, um, and this is anecdotal, those of you in the audience might be from or know people in Alaska, you can tell me this. I talked about Alaska before. I'm really curious as to not how it is that we got to that point with Alaska. Part of it is, could be, from what I've been hearing anecdotally, is that they have a tradition of just collecting data for all the Native American and Alaskan Eskimo tribes. And it's, a, it's ingrained in there already in their kind of like statutory bureaucratic DNA. And that just was an easy shift from that to Latinx populations. And lastly, the lack of a, of a cultural shift is what I would attribute to what's happening in New Mexico. It's a lack of a shift. It's because they either perceive no problem, like zero problem, um, or have bought into this notion that why do we continue to talk about race? And we gone beyond that. Isn't, are we, then we already passed the, uh, the wonderful mountaintop. And therefore, we're good when we know we're not. Uh, in Florida, I think uh, there were there were two shifts that led to where we are now, two and a half years down the road into this uh, criminal justice data transparency effort. Uh, one of which I mentioned before, it was the breakdown of those data fiefdoms, um, the lack or, or the willingness of entities that had been collecting data for their own purposes to uh, be willing to share that data with other reporters, or be willing to try something different, and be willing to sit down at the prompting of the legislature uh, to, to do it a different way and to find a standardized way of collecting the data. The second way, and I haven't mentioned this, is um, leadership in the legislature being willing to collect the data um, and not fear what the data tells us. I, at this point, um, the idea between uh, of of this of this database is it, it it will be raw data, and folks like recidivists and measure can have access to it and measure what they're interested in and tell us what's happening. Uh, one of the things that happened back in 2017 is a, a press outfit in Sarasota uh, did a multi-part newspaper article about bias on the bench. Um, uh, in that circuit, I think it's the 17th circuit, um, used certain data and then concluded that there was uh, racial disparities in the sentencing of individual judges and then showed it to those judges who, were, who then expressed shock that I, I had no idea I was, that was happening, but I'm going to take a look at it. The concern was that the data was from questionable sources and may have been... Um, not the best data that was available, right? So this effort will standardize data so that we're all reading from the same sheet music. And then when, when studies like that happen, then the critiques can focus, rightly so, on the methodology and the scientific method and the conclusions that, that were made. And I think that's one of the, 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 big ba uh, the big benefits of this, and the legislature is not afraid of that. And, and also, it, I, I'm going to plug something else. Uh, it, Florida has embarked on a health, health data transparency initiative that was begun back in 2014 or 2015 uh, that I worked on before the job I'm, I'm in now. So uh, across silos, uh, Florida is looking at data to help, help them make policy decisions down the road. Thank you. So, so will you guys agree that for the cultural shift to happen, and, and that was kind of our experience in Florida with, with the legislature, that the, there needs to be a champion, right? Like there needs to be a champion in a position to push things, things forward? I, I'll agree with that. The, the, uh, our chairman at the time when we started this project, uh, Representative Chris Sprouse, uh, is now, uh, as of last week, Speaker-designate Chris Sprouse. Mm -hmm. um, that carries a lot of clout with it. Um, he was also the champion behind the health care um, uh, data transparency effort as well. Uh, and then he just shifted his focus into criminal justice data. So absolutely, you, ne you need, in, in politics, you need a champion and you need a powerful champion. Mm -hmm. And from the uh, point of view of the advocates, Juan and, and Mimi, but Oh, no, no question mm -hmm. that you need it. And sometimes, sometimes a lawsuit would force it. Not always, but sometimes it, re it requires a champion in-house as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, unfortunately, um, organizations like mine need to be validated 
um, that's a whole different conversation. But to have that validation from those in power that are willing to kind of push against um, the old way of doing things and, and making things more innovative, like open data, um, is extremely important to the cause. I want to open to the public uh, 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 shortly, but um, I wanted to get a, a, a question that kind of like was coming up from the from the uh, first panel today, and um, is w the work you are doing um, in all the different areas that you guys are working is this? Um, will you consider it uh, in and of itself transformational? Or uh, do you think this is a step in the right direction and then more work is needed? Um, I, I think it's a little bit of both. It's definitely transformational for Florida um, to, to turn the aircraft carrier around and learn to crawl and start pulling ourselves up and start taking our first steps from a data uh, collection standpoint. Um, and it's it's a step in the right direction because there are almost on a weekly basis there are um, hiccups and barriers and problems to solve and things to get through um, getting people back on the same page to make sure we're all moving in the right direction um, so yeah I'll say it's both I, I also think it's both um, so Recidive is, is laying open source infrastructure that de-silos many of the data silos that exist at the state level, um, as well as at the county level in some cases. But the point of it being open source is that the work isn't done in a way. Like The idea is that you need one common infrastructure layer, much like what Florida is trying to do, and then you need a whole ecosystem of data-driven reforms to flourish on top of that. Um, and the whole idea is like researchers, advocates, and practitioners on some level need access to the same data. Like the data access is going to look a little different for practitioners. They need tools that are going to aid them in their daily decision making that are kind of woven into their flow. For researchers, they need much more open-ended access as well as advocates to kind of explore the questions that matter the most to them. So in that sense, like the amount of work is somewhat unbounded. But I do think it's transformational in the sense that we've seen a shift in the states we're working in from them being able to answer like some very basic questions on an annual basis after a lot of manual effort to them being able to like explore almost any question they would have about their data from yesterday. Like the data is now fresh and you can look at what's happening this week and you can look at you know, the punitivity of an individual parole officer or the racial disparity that exists in an individual district um, rather than sort of getting an aggregate report at the end of the year. So for the states that this exists, and I think that piece is already really important, but I think there's a lot of work left to do in terms of you know, the ecosystem being able to take advantage of that data and both build things for them and also do advocacy and research with it. Um. So the litigator in me recognizes that the, without the data, I won't be able to transform a damn thing. Um, and I go back to Stop and Fisk. The, the data that was collect, collected, collected as a result of a lawsuit, city council uh, pressure to get the data collected, then resulted in the data being, you know, being able to be analyzed for the purposes of the eventual Stop and Fisk litigation. And that transformed policing in New York City. Uh, but eventually, it's a tool. Um, from my perspective, it's a very important tool. It's indispensable in many ways, but at the end of the day, I, I would like to first know what the data says and then use the data to transform the entire system, if not change the entire system, if not abolish the entire system. It's a disconnect that, make that disconnect between the, we always have crime and punishment in our heads, right? Those two words go, those concepts go together like peanut butter and jelly. Well, I want to separate those two concepts. Punishment is not the only logical response to uh, violations or transgressions. And this data will help you do it. So I definitely agree that like the measure care model is transformational um, in this space because we are bringing communities together around this idea of data. Um, and we're not just bringing communities that are already in this space, but communities that would have never before looked at a data set um, and empowering them with that information. But it's transformational to 
um, a problem that has that is historic, right? And then the idea of data collection to me is also very historic. I always think about like Ida B. Wells, um, who in, is one of you know one of the women um, in the 1800s who did data collection around lynching and who was able to literally take on the system um, that perpetuated lynching, right? And so and that was data collection. Um, and so I feel like. I feel like we're, we're reimagining the ways that we, the community, can use this data um, and leverage open data um, in order to create change. So transformational, yes. However, we have, we have lessons to be learned from those that came before us. So my, my last question before I open it for real. Um, is this is a very complex ecosystem, right? Like, you know, anybody who's in this space will agree that it's a very, very uh, unique and complex set of problems and a very uh, complex uh, structure nationally. Um, my question for all of you is, how do we take these transformations that are happening at the local and state level and scale them up nationally? Like the problem is not just in Florida, the problem is not just in Austin, right? Like the problem is national. How do we take this to the nation? Can I, can I? okay. So I would say start talking about it, <laughs> you know, and start forming coalitions within your own, um, you know, within your own networks. I can just point to an example right now, and I hope everyone takes this down, the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing. There's one, this is one extremely innovative group of police practitioners, of academics, of researchers that work together in order to root out the um, uninformed tactics, practices, and um, policies that police keep doing without the without data or evidence backing it right and so what they're doing is they're working together they're sharing data they're sharing research and evidence in order to create change so creating these networks of people that are talking is extremely important there's no reason why we should not be talking to each other um, you know, through social media and, and other means. Um, but to me, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is, and then also be willing to lose power. Be willing to lose power and give up some of your power to those community members that are actually disparately impacted by it. Even myself, like I have an element of privilege that I know of, right? And so I have to kind of like take a step back even when we're doing like participatory action research and be like, you know what, they're right. You know, and, and so be willing to lose some of that power. I'm hopeful that what we do in Florida um, can serve as a starting point or a model for other states. Mm -hmm. I know that since we, uh, since the legislature passed the original law in 2018 and the updated law in 2019, there's been a lot of interest nationwide uh, from other states who want to attempt to do this as well. Mm -hmm. um, if, we, if we can serve as a roadmap for them, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if Florida can spend the time making the mistakes, solving the problems, getting over the humps, um, maybe the rest of the states don't have to recreate the wheel. Uh, I think that's the goal of the legislature. Um, I think legislation is a really good way to do it. I think another piece that's somewhat obvious is that technology is, is going to be helpful here. The first time that we, um, the very first state that we did, you know, there were 22 different tables that we were talking to, 22 silos, and it took us a couple of months. Um, and now it takes us a couple of weeks to do this. And so there, there are ways, like, like we're gonna see in Florida, we'll get better at this every time. Uh, and so I think that's one piece. The other, I would say, is celebrating successes. So I think when we see something good happening with data in this ecosystem, we need to get better at figuring out how we like bring that to light both for the sort of sharing of best practices piece that Mimi's talking about, and also just because like celebrating success works. Like from a psychological perspective, we're not doing enough of it on the data side of things. Um, and it's not, I, I think that's something that we need to put our heads together a little bit on to figure out like how do we really lift up the examples that are working um, and, and give people kind of like a toolkit for getting there themselves and make these problems feel one of the things I've observed a lot is that people feel these problems are really intractable. Mm -hmm. um, 
and this probably existed at the beginning of the Florida project too, people who were just like, this is overwhelming and isn't going to work. Um, and so the more that we can kind of celebrate successes, the more the easier it'll be to create a national movement, I think. So that's one piece. Can I build on what Clementine said? That's exactly what happened. Um, the first the first reaction from uh, the folks who were going to be required to report was hostility because mm -hmm. it wasn't going to work. We tried it before mm -hmm. um, and it was it was open hostility. There were several meetings that were tense. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Um, uh, but once, uh, as we went along this project and those successes were happening, you know, we solved problems. Mm -hmm. We got over humps. Uh, people started to, to realize, and by people I mean the reporting agencies, those, those fiefdom walls broke down and people realized, hey, this, this could actually work. This is not going to be as bad as I thought it was going to be. And, and you get that buy-in at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think celebrating those even minor um, successes at this development and, in, and evolution process has been key in getting everybody to buy in and get us to the point where we are now. Yeah, totally. I feel like half my job is just saying, like, you can do this. <laughs> we got it. I'll just add that the, um, from my perspective, the last 15 years easily have taught us that the states are laboratories and to the extent they continue to have jurisdiction and power over how to find their own criminal codes and how to deal with the population of people in prison, which is overwhelmingly as state prisons as opposed to the federal system, then we don't need Washington. What becomes national is that states start replicating what other states are doing as past practices. At best, the federal government can, can waive some federal dollars for data collection improvements, which will be, I'm sure, very welcomed. But um, until, until we get rid of the malaise of hyper-partisanship in DC, states is where the action is. For sure. So I want to open it to the public. Uh, Leah is going to come around with a microphone. Um, so before you state your question, can you please uh, stand up so we can see you and uh, the camera can hear you and uh, tell us who you are and uh, your affiliation? Thank you. Do you want to one? You, Leah, go ahead. Hi. Um, do I really want to stand up? No. Um, I'm Bill Dobbs, and uh, it's exciting to hear all this work that's gone on. Uh, amazing to think uh, that many of the issues that people at this conference have been working on 5, 10, 15 years ago, it would have been hallucination to think you could drive bail bond companies out of business and lots of other thinking. Um, some of these issues, of course, are hot button issues. What to do about really egregious crimes or even crimes that we think are really egregious. I work on one of those which is the sex offense registry and a whole raft of laws that, are, that pile punishment on other measures. So I'm excited about this workshop because data, um, pretty much this whole issue of how to deal with sex and punishment is marooned even by criminal justice reform forces. Uh, and right now the only nationally aggregated statistics the folks who brought us Stranger Danger, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, have quietly stopped doing those stats. So the government, the federal government doesn't do them. It's state by state. Lots of demographic information's missing, huge holes. We don't even really know. But there's over 900,000 people, well, people. There are over 900,000 listings nationally on the registry. It's astounding. So that means several million people impacted. Um, I'm looking for any comment or reaction from any panelists, and also after this session, any ideas or suggestions, because um, until we start dealing with punishments for egregious crimes, there's going to be a big obstacle in the middle of the road for other kinds of reforms. Anybody? What's the data that's missing? Uh, there's not a whole lot of data. Like in New York, you can see how many people are on the registry, how many people are out of state. But the demographic data, how many people are doing the equivalent of a technical violation, although in the registry realm, that's a new crime, failure to register. So the lack of attention by both reformers and scholars makes doing 
any kind of reform or even pushing for abolition, extremely difficult. And the strategy of um, registration and blacklisting is pretty much an incapacitation strategy. Florida, it's driven uh, people into poverty and homelessness. Witness the uh, Julia Tuttle Causeway encampment, which has been pushed and shoved around numerous times in the last decade. Uh, well, I, I can't address the, the Causeway situation. I, I, I'm aware of it. But I can tell you that uh, one of the data elements uh, to be collected is, um, well, well, first, each each individual who is um, entered in, into the database will be identified by a identification number um, so that you can track uh, that individual's experience in the criminal justice system uh, across time and across counties within the state. One Mike, of the that, oh, sorry. Is that an anonymized identification number? Yes, yes. So it, it's, it's scrubbed, uh, de-identified, uh, that's, that's a big, a, a big uh, concept for Florida, not just in the criminal justice database world, but also in, obviously in the health um, insurance database world uh, and some other things that we're doing. But, but one of the data elements to be collected is uh, whether or not the individual is a, uh, has a sexual offender flag in his or her case, um, uh, case um, information. Uh, so perhaps uh, once that database is up and running, uh, hopefully by January 1st, 2020, the data will be there to begin some of those um, some of those exploration of those issues, and you might have that data at least for Florida. I think Jim in the front. Thanks, Gypsy. Uh, Jim Parsons, the Institute of Justice. So I um, enjoyed the. I agree the conversation about how you take data and use it to drive change. I think it's an important conversation to have. One of the examples given was using outliers. So those places that are doing particularly badly and, and, and highlighting them and um, saying you need to do better. However, in many places, many states, everywhere is doing badly. <laughs> and uh, even the top of the list needs to do better. Yeah. And so how do you avoid, how do you do this ranking without letting off half of the jurisdictions you're listing by, think, by them thinking, well, we're about the median, we're doing fine. Um, when that is actually probably the wrong message to give. What some lessons about how you've kind of approached that problem? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it turns out that like metric design is a really deep and tricky thing, not just for this reason, but also because often if you're driving a single metric and there's something called Goodhart's Law, which is that as soon as you call a number a metric, it ceases to be a good metric because you find various ways to game it basically. And so my whole life is like Goodhart's Law and trying to get around it. And so the way we do specifically what you're talking about is we know it's powerful to compare you to your neighbors. Um, we, we usually do that by not geographical neighbors, but kind of like synthetic neighbors. So if I am supervising a domestic violence caseload, I will compare you to other officers in the state who are, who are supervising a domestic violence caseload. The way that we make sure that the goal is high enough is by having leadership set it. So specifically right now, we've been helping states reduce technical revocations. And so what we're doing is trying to get them to a, to a historic low. And so we start by analyzing all of their data that we can get from ever, which is usually about 50 years, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, and we say, what would it look like for technical revocations to be lower than they've ever been? At the officer level, then we start by sort of comparing them to their neighbors, because that's what works psychologically. But the actual baseline goal that they're going for is also visible to them. And so they can both sort of see, how am I, as a parole officer supervising a domestic violence caseload, doing relative to others in the state? But also, what would I have to do? What would my unit have to do? What would my district have to do? And the state overall to get to our goal. Does that make sense? So there's kind of like the top pressure of the actual overall goal and the steps that you'd need to take there, as well as that more granular kind of comparison piece. Hi, I'm Lisa Foster. I'm the co-director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. And my question is really very nuts and bolts. It costs money to collect data. And you have to invest in new systems to collect data. So I'm particularly curious about um, how you persuade and what arguments will persuade legislators or local elected officials or even a police department to begin to collect data when it involves money, and particularly in a place like Florida, where um, 
revenue sources are scarce, um, what arguments worked um, to get the legislature to make that investment. Um, and then the second part of that is devising schemes that are cost effective. In a previous life in California, I was a veteran of the multi-billion dollar failed experiment in getting the California court system to adopt a single integrated case management system, um, which was an abysmal and, as I said, multi-billion dollar failure. So how do, we, um, how do we make it affordable and how do we get government to begin to invest in collection? Uh, in Florida, with regard to the initial investment, I think it goes back to having a champion. Um, the, uh, the Florida House had a very willing partner in the Florida Senate, uh, which doesn't always happen. Um, but in this particular case, uh, it did, and um, significant general revenue resources have been dedicated to the project over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, it, it, it just comes back to that, that having someone who, ha who believes in the project uh, to convince his or her um, fellow legislators that this is the right direction to head in, and that's what worked in Florida. And, and I'll add to that, that also coming from the work in Florida, um, is kind of like if you start with certain pilots and start like doing work there that can then be scaled up to other uh, jurisdictions, at least within the same state, that are using the same systems, right? Then you can make a lot of the data uh, or, or, or a lot of the solutions open source for those for those uh, other jurisdictions. And I, I don't know if Clem... You guys, one of your, your pillars is open source, so I don't know if you want to talk about it. Yeah, I, when I first came into this space, I remember someone, I think it was a funder, reacted by saying that data was really expensive. Like, and, and I remember, like, it blew my mind because I was coming from the private sector where data is kind of, like, software is seen as the cheapest thing. Like, you can clone it a bazillion, gajillion times and sell it for 99 cents. And so, you know, there's a big question in this space about why states have to pay nine million dollars and wait four years for like garbage technology to be delivered when you can pay 99 cents on your phone and get like a pretty slick app. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why that's true, but I think the, the biggest and most important one that at least we're trying to tackle is open source. It's the fact that like proprietary technical vendors are incentivized in ways that are very transparent to make their software unbuildable upon by other people because it means that they can not only win the upfront contract for a lot of money, they can also be the only ones capable of improving or expanding that software. And so uh, not only do they want to win the $10 million contract upfront, they want to actually kind of make it a crappy experience so that you need a lot of technical support. And if you want to add a feature or sometimes extract like a basic report from your own database, you're going to pay for it. Like we have come across contracts um, at the state and county level where the vendor actually took over ownership of the data uh, in ways that the state or county maybe didn't understand at the time. And so like, that's not uncommon. Um, and yeah, the incentives in this space for for-profit tech companies are straightforward and, and really sinister. And so what I would say is like, technology is not the expensive part. Uh, the, the expensive part is the incentives and the way they're set up today. Um, and open source is like a proven model for trying to break down those barriers. So. I think we have a question here. Thank you. Hi, Kevin Keenan from the Vera Institute. Um, are there other states where legislation is moving, part A, and part B, uh, have there been legislative efforts at the local level uh, that could be effective in the Florida model, obviously challenged by the jurisdictional issues, but for those places where we don't want to wait for state legislation, is there a way to um, legislative through city council and county government um, get some of the way there. I can answer the question about the other states. Um, so it, California just passed a bill. Uh, it's on the governor's desk right now. Has it been signed? I don't think so. Um, but it's the same bill. It's AB, AB 30, uh, 1331, which is the same bill that is uh, cleaning up the criminal records. 
uh, to make um, you know the automatic expungement uh, uh, easier. But it's, oh, it, there was also a clause there that um, clarifies some of the um, laws that judges were misinterpreted that uh, made them think that they could not uh, share bulk data. Now that is clarified there. So like at least in terms of access to data, it should be better. Um, Colorado also this session passed a law that's also just a first step, um, but it's a law that requires jail administrators to report aggregate level data on pretrial, um, you know, uh, on pretrial populations mostly um, to a, a state agency. Connecticut um, also passed a law that uh, whereby prosecutors have to start uh, reporting certain data elements to a state uh, a state agency as well, and um, we have been in conversations. Uh, with uh, other states as well. So this is something that really, you know, as Mike said, Florida kind of like created a momentum for this um, and there is appetite. I, I would say, I, you know, it's very early on in the process, um, but I would say that at least uh, six other states are interested. Uh, just wanted to mention one thing. We took it, we took advantage of um, the FBI's requirement for uh, states reporting crime statistics moving from summary reporting to NIBRS, National Incident-Based Reporting System. Um, Florida FDLE was, in my personal opinion, dragging its feet trying to get there by 2021, which is being required. Um, and, and the fact that NIBRS contains a lot more specific data about a specific incident of crime um, and that FDLE was beginning its process to switch over from summary summary-based reporting to incident-based reporting, we took advantage of that. Um, we, some of the, the funding that was uh, provided or appropriated for the, um, the data, database transparency project uh, was also uh, tagged for moving to the NIBR system, or we call it FIBRS, so Florida incident-based reporting, um, because there was a lot of overlap. So let's take advantage of some of those. If you're gonna collect it anyway, um, let's, as you're sending it to the FBI, send it down this pipeline too uh, for the cloud-based database, and that's where we're at. Um, I don't have the examples handy uh, right now, but in my office we can get you information about efforts at the county level in Florida to increase prison cla prisoner classification at the county level with respect to race and ethnicity that was done in the last five years. So there's some examples of how that could work at the local level. But at the local level, I I don't know. I don't think so. I think a lot of places. I mean, it depends. I, I I'm, I'm lying. Like maybe um, there's some counties that are starting to look at the integration of data. Um, you know, and and Pinellas, which is one of the pi the pilot counties, was already integrated. Um, which is making you know the transition to the reporting requirements easier, um, but yeah, I don't. I mean, outside of Pinellas, I'm not sure um, what other local legislations are taking over on this. Allison, you had something. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Pierre, and I'm the head of Innovative Prosecution Consulting. I'm a um, a former state prosecutor from Brooklyn. And I was also a prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. My question is very straightforward. I think it's transformational what you all are doing with Department of Corrections and police departments. I'm referring the question to Clementine and, and Mimi. My question is, uh, would you all consider working with the state prosecutor's office to do this exact work? And if you don't do it now, is that something that is in the future? Short answer, yes. <laughs> um, there is, so there, there was this like national report that came out just very recently called Girlhood Interrupted. I don't know if you've heard of that report. Um, I believe it's out of Georgetown, Georgetown University. Anyway, it, um, it really shed some light on like the adultification of black girls and how that leads to overcriminalization of black girls. What adultification is, is how adults see girls starting at the age of five, black girls as less innocent, as needing less protection, nurturing comfort, as more sexualized, having better, you know, having attitudes and so forth. Um, 
And so we're working with a local organization called Lone Star Justice Alliance in Austin, Texas. And so to create training, we remember how I talked about innovative disruptive training for like prosecutors and defense attorneys in order to shed some light on what adultification bias looks like and how that can then lead to better outcomes in the system, um, how it can lead to kind of pushing back against black girls being six to seven times more likely to receive a suspension at their schools. So I think those partnerships are so incredibly um, um, important for local organizations like mine. Uh, my short answer is also yes. I think for us, the question is what do prosecutors need to see uh, from the data every day, like what are the use cases? And I think there are some, you know, very smart people I've talked to thinking about this, but it feels like there are a lot of parallels between, uh, from, from the early things that I've heard, there are a lot of parallels between what prosecutors need to see and some of the other work we've done. Um, for example, like what the racial disparity is in the recommendations that they're making or what the long-term downstream outpack, uh, impacts and outcomes are. Uh, so yeah. We should definitely talk about it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andy Davis. I'm uh, coming from the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center in Dallas, Texas. Um, I wanted to ask about your various theories of change. I might have missed it, but I think it was Mimi who used the term theories of change and had, I thought, actually a really impressive and unusual idea about how data might somehow relate to change. It seems to me that you're all in slightly different relationship to decision makers. Some of you are working directly with decision makers. Some of you are kind of inside government. Some of you are outside. Um, and I wonder, therefore, what respectively you think the data transparency efforts that you're engaged in will result in in terms of change and how you think that change will happen. It seems that you must probably all have a slightly different idea about how data and policy change are related, and maybe no specific expectation about how exactly it will be related. So I'd just be really interested to hear more about what you think of that. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, I, I think that we're seeing a willingness of the Florida legislature to take a, a good, hard look at what the data is revealing. right? Uh, and then making policy decisions, if any are necessary, based on that. Um, access to the database, uh, hopefully early next year, uh, as groups um, like Clementines and, and anybody who wants access to it start taking a look at things, um, start revealing issues that maybe we didn't know about, or were uh, not at the forefront um, become or move to the forefront, um, then those discussions at the policy level, policy making level happen. Um, not always does policy change happen as quickly as we get um, notice or information based on the data that's there, but it starts the conversation. It starts with a workshop in a committee meeting. It starts with uh, members talking to each other. It starts with more stakeholders who who are pushing for change, having meetings with members, and members then talking to staff and talking amongst themselves. And that's the process. Um, so I, I I think the expectation for Florida legislators is that the database uh, will number one be comprehensive, uh, include everything. Uh, we are currently collecting or can collect um, and uh, is flexible enough to expand once our technology catches up and we're able to do that. Either we've, we've got the funds to do it um, or someone like Measures for Justice is helping out uh, other, other government entities uh, and that that database then um, can reveal some things that maybe we, we could not be revealed before this part, uh, before this point. Um, and then, then the discussions start, and that's that's how policy change happens, at least in Florida. So mine is pretty straightforward, right? It's the fact that so many states don't even know how many Latinos are arrested in prison on parole operation. Simple as that. So to the extent that we have collected data that allows us to figure out what's the impact, we'll have a better chance to uh, ward off 
to like racial impact statements, what are some of the changes that the legislation is considering that actually would make conditions worse? And the war throws off. So the theory of change is collect the data, engage Latinx populations in the, in the effort for reform, and stop the worsening of the system. It's already a racialized system. I'm just curious how we can have a conversation about how fully racialized it is if we're missing such a big segment of the U.S. population. Yeah, um, and I, I think I explained my theory of change pretty, pretty um, deeply, like during my um, during my time. But I mean, quite honestly, I, and I and I hope to say this, but I just hope that organizations, like as we work with them, just stop making shit up. I mean, it's it's that simple. I mean, to be very honest with you, and I'm sorry for my language. Um, I'm getting, I'm trying to get better at that, but. It's really just stop making stuff up. You know, it's hurting people and it's costing too much money. Like it's that simple to me. And it's like when we use the data in order to inform decisions, when we u when we allow people to have their voice heard, when we work together with communities, like in my mind, this panel right here, like we could we could really change some stuff all together, right? And so that's that's really my thought. It's like when you empower people with the data to work together with the institu with the institutions that that have the um, the power to change laws and ordinances and, and so forth, then you create change. I mean, it's 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 just we're better together. So my theory of change is that open source infrastructure is going to do two things: one on the inside and one on the outside. So on the inside. Like really, I'm a product person and believe that if you get the right data to the right person at the right time, which turns out to be really hard and complicated, like it could be a prosecutor, it could be a parole officer, then that will change behavior. And that the way that you need to do that needs to be ensconced within a quantifiable top level goal. So you have to know what you're aiming for. You have to be empowered to act on the data. You have to feel like you trust the data and that it's yours and that you own it somehow. Like there's a lot of things that go into that. But also, like, I've worked on products that have like a billion users. Like, it is absolutely true that if you do this the right way, it, it can work and can change behavior. Um, and so I think that's one thing. It's like, um, and I think it's the least popular of our two theories of change is that agencies themselves um, and system actors themselves can play a really important role in making use of the data. But I think the nice thing about open source infrastructure is that it all also powers the outside of the ecosystem. So like research and advocacy, we know those work. And so the question there is like, how can we scale those things? And how can we make it so that not all of the research in this country is done in Kentucky and Harris County? Because those are the two places where the county level data is like nicely scoped and available. Um, so how can we scale research and scale advocacy efforts and basically make this data more, more publicly available? Um, so it's sort of a, a two-pronged thing. I forgot what you were asking the question. Yeah. So we have only a few minutes left. Is there any other questions? Andy? You want I have a simple one. I, well, a short one. What's the difference between the California uh, Open uh, Justice Data Bill, uh, even its 2.0 version now, the 1331, <clears throat> and what you have in Florida? And could you compare and contrast and tell me which one has the advantages and disadvantages? And maybe Gypsy, that's a question for you. I don't know. Um, uh, sure. So, so the the Florida database is the idea is that it will be linked, right, from arrest, well, from referral to the prosecutor to sentencing, right? Like, so it will fall, it will track a um, case from beginning to end. The open, um, the open justice. Uh, what is it? Open data justice in California. Um, it's more. Uh, it's a collection of separate data sets. So they have, you know, a collection of use of force, a collection of misconduct, but they're not really connecting the cases from beginning to end. So I would say that's the the main difference. Also, the the um, the California uh, data collection is more focused on policing. Um, whereas the the Florida database, like I said, is going to go cut across prosecutors, courts, public defenders, DOC, etc. So so it's more um, more t Florida is going to be more transversal, and the uh, California um, DOJ one is more um, um, is like more topical, like it's a collection of data sets that are more topical around policing. that 
the Florida one, in theory, would be better. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> say that. And the reason I say that, uh, so I'm Barry Sheck. I'm from the Innocence Project. And <clears throat> so we have a very interesting problem uh, in the United States dealing with forensic science. Mm -hmm. So we find out that a forensic science laboratory in some jurisdiction, and all of you have had them, right, has uh, had, a, 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 they call them a nonconformity, right? This can be a laboratory analyst that did the wrong thing or wasn't doing controls or uh, just was taking drugs in Massachusetts, um, or we can have just a new, we can have a forensic assay which has been demonstrated to be no longer scientifically reliable. Mm -hmm. And if you read the 2009 NAS report, you've been following what's been going on with National Commission on Forensic Science, you'll know that there are an awful lot of those assays out there. So later we're going to find out that things that courts decided on, people arrested for, people were convicted for, are no longer uh, valid, mm -hmm. put simply. We don't have anything in this system, and I'm hoping that in Florida you'll be able to tell me, yes, you can, right? That if you're in the crime lab, right, and we get your crime lab number, we can connect that to an arrest number, to an indictment number, and to ultimately what happens to a case, and then we can begin to follow all the other actors in the system. Is that true in Florida? Is that true in California? Is that true anywhere? I think the short answer is no, but I'll let Mike talk about Florida. Yeah, I, I think that's right. At, at this point, uh, no. But um, there is flexibility being built into the database in Florida where, remember I was talking about we're in the infancy of data collection in Florida, so we're just learning to crawl right now. That may be something a year or two down the road in phase three or four when we're, we're walking and we're pretty steady on our feet and we can start running, that is something we can definitely look into to start making those connections. So my point to you is if you can't do that yet, right, uh, can you think about it again? Mm -hmm. Because it's a huge problem and I don't know what you're thinking about if you haven't figured out that one. Thank you, Barry. You should send us some emails. <laughs> Help us think about it. Um, well, we have only now two minutes. Um, if there are no additional questions, I wanted to close uh, with one question for everybody. What will you, from, e from each of your vantage points, recommend to other people out there who are trying to move the ball of criminal justice re reform forward um, you know, through the use of data? for me is just do not discount or um, the voices of your community. Um, the measure care model, again, I'm going to keep preaching this because it's it's really a way for, for you to find these innovative solutions from the local level, from the ground up. Um, and so just validate those voices, work with them. I guess my recommendation would be to email us. Um, we have access to so much data at this point. I think we have like 10% of the you know, national incarcerated population in prison. So let us know. We're trying to figure out how we partner with more um, academics and advocates. So that's my concrete solution that's maybe not that inspirational because email is not that fun. So data collection would allow for a much more clearer picture of the effects, and I would urge that data would allow for a much more inclusive conversation about reform. Um, I, would, <laughs> I would say that I would make myself available to go in a little bit more depth uh, through email, the most unexciting way to con converse, uh, about how Florida started, how we got to where we are, and how we're evolving. Um, because I think, I think bigger things are, are going to happen. Keep an eye on Florida. At, at least uh, finding a champion to at least ask the question, what do we have? Where is it? What don't we have? With what we have, what are you doing with it? I think that's the place to start. 
Well, thanks so much to all of our pa amazing panelists, and thank you so much to all of you. Little housekeeping, I believe we have 15 minutes break, is that right? And then we have a second breakout section, session, so don't miss the next uh, amazing panels. Thank you so much. Thank you.